I'd like to actually just start with Nanda, who's all the way over there, <laughs> um, and to ask you about the Internet of Things um, very specifically, and to ask you how you think the, what the potential of such networks is uh, to kind of build these sustainable, energy-efficient homes and cities of the future. And do you see how do you see that playing out, and what are your reservations? Do I need this? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Um, definitely, in, in terms of thinking about how buildings are built today, like conventional construction, it's all quite dumb, <laughs> right? Like you put an air conditioner on, there's a thermostat, right? And basically, it just, all it does is it switches it on, hits a certain temperature, right? Then once people in the room start to heat it up again, uh, it switches it on and off. It just basically switches it on and off. That's all it does. That thermostat, that remote control that you use, so that's all it's doing. So if you can put some some smarter technology into this room, for instance, right, to know how many people are in here, to know what they're doing, to predict how much air cooling they'll need, uh, you can definitely increase the efficiency, the energy efficiency of a building quite dramatically just with simple intelligent devices that already exist today. Have you experimented with this at all? Um, well, I built using a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> I built myself something to turn the hot water in our house on and off. So that was an interesting experiment. Um, it's so easy to do. Anyone can do it. And it made a huge difference to us. Uh, Sunila, I'd love to come in here with you because I know that you are also kind of building these extraordinarily large resorts, but you are very environmentally conscious. And I'm wondering how you balance these things, these large buildings, luxury. Uh, could you use your mic? Yeah. Um, actually, I don't build uh, large resorts. That's uh, uh, keep it as a small footprint. Right. Um, I don't do anything over thirty rooms. Right. And that also uh, depends on it. It's at least uh, almost an acre per room. Oh wow! So, uh, so <laughs> I try to. Uh, that's what I try to keep it at. Sometimes it's. Uh, difficult to do that but then we compensate in other ways but I don't do large resorts never have never intend so when you're thinking about something like Viluyana um, you know which is actually kind of harking back superficially I suppose to the past and to this this idea of also you know kind of rural <laughs> idyllic bliss I mean how are you also incorporating technology and things to make them envi kind of environmentally sustainable and also energy efficient? Um, well, it, okay, so for instance, going back to your first, uh, what you first said, we learned started off with 24 rooms in uh, 25 acres. And uh, some of the technology that uh, they have used heat pumps, which uh, collect moisture and convert it uh, from the AC's for Sorry, uh, you said? Heat pumps. Heat pumps, right. Um, I also use traditional uh, materials, uh, but uh, incorporate them in ways that, like for instance, uh, the, the wall plaster was uh, a mix of clay and uh, cement so that wouldn't require constant painting and uh, chemical usage and so on. Um, then I bring in things like uh, you know, uh, old systems like the Tanpita system, which uh, creates a space under a building uh, where it's raised up on some kind of a stump, and that provides uh, passive cooling. So these are some of the systems I use. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a big leap here also because we're, we're short on time and go straight to Shamindra. Um, Shamindra, I mean, we're, we're talking about the kind of the role news will play in the future, and that was very much what your, your speech was about. Um, in, in the report that Nalika launched yesterday, Digital Transformations, he also talked about this kind of the skyrocketing use of mobile phones and how that's impacting news. I was curious, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the devices of the future will be? How will we be, how will we 
kind of access journalism? Is it going to be immersive? How, how do you think this is going to play out? So, Smithy, you and I are still holding on to this notion, notion that we, we still matter in the future. <laughs> yes, I, 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 <laughs> I'm not going to give up on it just yet. <laughs> in the bigger picture, yeah. I'm not so sure. I yeah. mean, uh, uh, journalism as a practice, I'm not so sure. Yeah. But, but I think answering that question, why matters? So take a hypothetical, take a, a bomb went off in some city somewhere. How do you think people are going to actually find out about it? How do you think they're going to kind of see that? Like, like most of us would do, you know, you'd, you'd log on to Facebook or something like that. So you think Facebook 30 years from now, we'll oh, yeah. still be scrolling and reading and... I mean, it's, it's, I'm not sure what that platform will be. Yeah. But I think, I think we've sort of devised these communities. Uh, we, we used to be organized around, around communities and that tavern or the temple, you know, uh, pardon me, I should say temple, but, uh, uh, but it, was, it was tavern in certain societies. It's, 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 it's a place of gathering, you know, this, this is where the exchange of ideas and views happened or the exchange of information took place. I think, uh, I think we will, we, we now have, and, and it's, this is not a reflection of the future, we, we all share our, our views on, on, on some virtual community that, that we identify with, that, uh, that potentially shares the same sorts of values that, that, that we share. And, and I think this, the, and for this community to deal with the who, what, where, why, uh, who, what, where, etc. Is, is not a very complicated thing to do, I think. Uh, do we need professionals to do this? I doubt it. I doubt, I, I think there's a big hollowing out in the industry that we work in, where the middle is disappearing, where the vast majority of journalists work. Um, there, is, there is growth in the trivial, the, the yellow journalism, the clickbait sort of journalism. It's, 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 it's not journalism, it's, it's taken off. And there is there is tremendous or greater interest in 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 the sort of the journalism that that deeply discusses the choices facing us. The middle of just telling something somebody based on fact that this happened is disappearing. Right. And and I think communities will take over that role. Mm -hmm. And you think they'll share share it in video? They'll share it in kind of from the ground? Yeah. And, and, and you see this in mass media today, you yeah. know, it's, it's not unusual at all to switch on the news and find the biggest networks in the world using video, social, uh, video they've sourced from, from social media. How, how did we learn or how did we see footage of what was happening in the, in the Arab Spring? Yeah. It was all uh, social, uh, it was all stuff that people shot on their mobile phones. So to answer your question, I'm not sure what the device of the future is going to be, honestly. I'm, I'm not that futuristic, uh, that futurist. Uh, however, I think it will, it will revolve around these virtual communities. So I have a question for Sri Ganesh that I'll come back to you on, but I just wanted to get Nanda's thoughts very quickly on this idea of um, this idea that our, our, our jobs are imperiled and that we and journalists might not exist. What do you think? I mean, you with Aniva, you've had some experience. Right, so we, we, we founded Aniva. Hello? Yeah. We founded Aniva because we really thought there was a big space in the Singhala kind of media space to build up a company that would give people something different. Um, but as it turns out, it was very difficult for us to raise an investment round. And I think I've been reading about this since and trying to figure out why. And there has been a huge kind of a pulling back from people investing in digital media. And uh, you see that everywhere. You see that in the States, uh, where companies like the big ones like Vox and BuzzFeed have all missed their revenue targets. You know, and they're being forced to lay off, you know, whole hundreds of people. So definitely, um, I don't know if journalism as the profession is ever going to completely disappear. But like Shamindra said, there's definitely some sort of pairing back or hollowing out or something of that nature happening in that media space. I mean, all media now basically I feel is digital media, right? So that space is definitely changing. Um, and I think it is a pulling back. Thank you. Um, Sri Ganesh, I also want to kind of, you were there yesterday for the session and I wanted to ask you, I mean, when we're, we're talking a lot about big data analytics and also how that's shaping media, etc. Um, 
I was fascinated with your with your vision for the future and with also with Namali, who I think will now become a, a running uh, reference among this whole crowd here. Um, but we've had this recent Supreme Court ruling in Sri Lanka, uh, in India, sorry, about pri privacy being this kind of fundamental right. Uh, and we were t thinking about what that what implications that would be if you had a kind of a right to privacy enshrined in the constitution in Sri Lanka. And I wondered what implications that would have for the creation of Namili and for this kind of this future that you envision. Um, um, okay, uh, tough question. Um, I, I think the right to privacy as an idea, and I'm not a privacy expert by any means. It's not my usual uh, cup of joe uh, in the morning. Um, but the right to privacy as a principle is well and good to put that in practice is kind of difficult because I, I don't think I can articulate what that means in practice and I'll, and I'll tell you why because if you look from an individual perspective how we articulate our own individual privacy needs is through use cases and to use all of these to encapsulate to what a generalizable privacy law should be in my opinion is difficult and, and, and the example I used you know uh, of I, I made Shazna a smoker, I, I'm a smoker, um, and, I, and, and it is that use case where I wouldn't mind going into Cargill's and using my credit card to buy a pack of cigarettes, and then Cargill's, because I use top points, will tell me on my next time that, hey, if you buy five cartons, you'll get 20, five packs, you'll get 30% discount, right? Uh, but I don't want that information going to my health insurance firm. And the reason why I put that example of, of Shazna's uh, cigarette, etc., was because at some point, you know, that, that actually may, I may consider a violation of my privacy, uh, but the greater, but it is actually impacting premiums for everybody else. Uh, and that, as someone will have to come in and make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis of exposed about or may exposed in some ways but not through uh, tort law but rather through principles uh, that will be encapsulated on a case by case basis that's what i think it will evolve into uh, and do you see the next decade or two as being a place where we make some of these decisions I, I think so almost certainly i think by 2048 it will be because um, well before that, we will have made some progress in, in our articulation of how do we handle this. What we have currently is things like informed consent, right? But we sign credit card applications without ever having read the fine print. So this is, a, 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 a pardon my friend, CYA, right? For the legal basis of doing it, you, you sign that statement, but it, in practicality, it really means nothing. And this idea of control in in, in, in these boundary conditions of what information we should share, etc., won't really be practiced in that particular fashion definitely before 2048, because uh, we are doing it already. Just a, one final question. I mean, for us, there's so much anxiety around these ideas of you know, personal data economies, of our data being exploited. Um, I think for the wider public, these issues are the things that we're debating so much. But from the inside, for you, what are the concerns? What are the gaps that uh, data scientists are trying to plug and are kind of addressing in this period? So right now, um, the question of bias in algorithms and data is on everybody's mind. Um, the state of the art in trying to understand and leave alone addressing it is still very much in its embryonic stages. Uh, because we don't even know at this point what the solution should be. So a simple example would be that, you know, it used to, it was a case that if you searched, if you put doctor into Google and image search and it 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 points out, you know, white male people who happen to have wearing a doctor's thing. You can ask the question, okay, what you know, that's biased towards white males, white Caucasians, maybe there should be more African Americans, etc. Uh, so I, maybe I should feed it more data of African-American doctors. But what is an equitable solution to that? Which is, should it, the answers that it gives of the images should be of equal proportion of the African-American community in the United States or uh, Sri, in, uh, if it's in the Sri Lankan context, let's say equal as per the population, 
x percent of Sinhalese, x percent of Tamils, x percent of Muslims, etc. Uh, in that sense, or should it be based on the number of doctors who happen to be in Sri Lanka or of x percent? These are sort of questions that we need to ask collectively. Uh, we don't even know what some of those questions are, but I think. Uh, our fears are being driven, unfortunately, by imaginations. And most of, and I know that's the task that you've given, uh, y'all gave me today to to imagine what the future might look like. But most of my work is, I'm I'm fighting away. Let's not imagine the benefits or the pos or the negatives. Let's see what we can do right now in the here and the now. Thank you, um, Sunila. This imagination about big data has, as he you know, just mentioned, actually has taken us to places where we're concerned about minorities, we're concerned about underserved communities as well being kind of targeted. And in this future that you envision where we're able to, to leave the city behind, um, I would also argue that there will be people who will not be able to, you know, that you will have poverty, that you will still have some of these issues. I was curious about how you think those things could be addressed in these future cities of the future. I mean, how do you see things like agriculture, you know, coming into cities? How do you see urbanization becoming something that might um, actually be a, a wonderful process and connect people? So I think I did uh, uh, touch on the, the fact that uh, those beautiful, the, the other, yes, the are the vertical, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, sustainable spaces as well, and I don't see why those couldn't uh, be uh, spaces where one could farm and have some degree of self-sufficiency. This is being done very successfully in some buildings in New York where they're doing rooftop farming, beekeeping, so on. And I think that thought could be expanded, buildings could be designed so that each, uh, each of those uh, units could have the space to uh, provide some level of uh, self-sufficiency. But as I said, uh, not everyone is going to be digging up their own potatoes. You know, so they, then they would have other skills. As for poverty, um, it's too big a question for me to even understand how, uh, but I would imagine it would break down equitably just as it always has. There will be some in uh, vertical spaces, some in horizontal spaces. Um, as for the reach of uh, you know technologies and stuff, um, I always think of uh, uh, you know uh, the Chandra Babu Naidu, who is, uh, is or was the chief minister of uh, Andhra Pradesh, who brought technology down to the illiterate uh, farmers and. Uh, these are ideas which can be developed, and we have 30 years. Plenty <laughs> <laughs> of time. Yeah. Uh, Shamindra, I'd like to kind of get you in a way to also build on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to get you in a way to build a little bit on the, the data analytics and what um, Sri Ganesh talked a little bit about. Um, so in this future that you envision, I also see these kind of proliferating small media outfits that are targeting niche audiences. You know, that's how and they're able to just like very specifically perhaps uh, you know cater to people who are I, I remember seeing a, um, a newsletter that was for people fans of carnivorous plants so you know I imagine that we will have increasingly niche uh, publications but I also think that for so long you know when you talked about the value of journalism in democracy it's been in us having a consensus in us having a starting point for conversations in society where we agree that these are the facts as that kind of increasingly shifts, how do you think communities will change and respond to this? That's a fairly broad question, but let, let me let me put this forward. Okay, this this is not a fully formed idea, but but uh, here's the thing: when when mass media, as we know it, started uh, uh, primarily in the U United States about about 200 years ago, uh, there. The, the, the facts in the reporting then were minimal. It was, it was partisan, it was agenda driven, it was, um, uh, and it seemed to serve the purpose at that point. I think uh, as, as we got organized as an industry, we somehow got, got this notion that hey, the, 
the facts are sacred and, and nothing more important than the fact. I think potentially, because because how we view, with, view the world, the facts can be also, uh, you, you can have your version of, of the facts, you can have your version of, of the data. And I think that will matter more in the future. I think, uh, and opinion, or, or answering that question, why I think may matter more, as we organize ourselves into these communities or these groups with shared passions or shared values or, or, or a mixture of, of these stuff, okay? I, I'm just trying to be provocative here. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, a future reflection of media or future reflection of news will have less to do with facts and more to do with opinions. That worries me. Does that worry you? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Going back to a point that you made. I don't know if this mic is working. Uh, uh, going back to a point that you had made uh, earlier about the who, what, when, where will be answered by community. I don't think it's necessarily, it will be uh, an active decision on people or things that will do that part of sharing the what, why, where, and, 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 and when. It will be from all kinds of sources, it's not just people, it's from the camera, the traffic camera, etc., or the whatever sensors that are there. So I, I, I feel sort of where I'm sort of trying to disagree with him is that in my sort of vision of the future, I don't, I think we will come to that point where facts in the terms of these basic uh, of the who, where, what, when uh, will be difficult to, to argue about. It's in the why where we will have lots of different opinions, etc., uh, and 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 ways of using data to to uh, persuade people to uh, to to come to my understanding of the why rather than his understanding of the why. That's where the battle or the things will be. But you know, when you're looking at this this kind of new wave of reporting on fake news, uh, where they're talking about being able to completely for you know this forged videos, um, totally fabricated things that I, I don't know that, do you, do you trust that people are going to be able to tell the difference? I, I don't think... Are the facts really going to be that certain? Um, people potentially not, <laughs> but I think this is where we will rely more on and more on, on normally, yeah. right? Yeah. With, to give us this synthesized, distilled pictures of, you know, there is X percent who seem to be believing this explanation, there's Y percent who seem to be believing that. Because right now, as, as humans, and this is the truth for even for going forward, we will not have evolved that much that we'll be able to consume that load of information. We have trouble right now. Uh, so we are, of course, uh, like our confirmation biases, etc. And that's where the little needling of the paternalistic libertarianism of behavioral psychology will have to come in in some form, either through data regulators or et cetera, to, to give us a share of these different opinions, opinions, but the facts, I think, will be indisputable. Thank you. And, uh, and, and just to add to that, <laughs> and, and I think that the pushback's already happening, right, yeah. uh, around fake news. Um, it, it seemed to be driven by this desire to have large audiences, and every, everybody found, or at least, at least the bigger players, found this a very convenient thing to, to work around. You know, you may, uh, the, the, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world found that, oh, oh this, this is a great way to go about it. Let's not challenge this. I think that pushback is already happening, and I think it's only a matter of time before an alternative emerges, the sort of uh, one Sri Ganesh is talking about. It's, it's only, I mean, I'm thinking this will happen very, very, very soon, uh, where, where some AI mechanism will help screen this stuff out for us. If, if, if the big guys don't do it, uh, there's like, they're, they're just creating an opening for somebody else to step into. Right? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly jump over to Nanda to just have a, to talk about energy a bit. Um, I was struck again in your presentation where you had this very strong cross over uh, nuclear energy. Um, and I know that there are many scientists who feel that, who feel the same way, share your concerns. Um, but they, there have been these kind of ideas mooted for, they say, warehouse-sized uh, nuclear energy plants, you know, kind of off floating ones that are far out to sea. I mean, would you still have reservations if the technology were to evolve? 
in that direction? I, I think the trend is clear, right? The world is moving away from nuclear. There have been, I mean, in the past, with Chernobyl or Fukushima, it's always risky, right? You're always, I mean, basically, if you want to put this near a city, you're putting a city at risk, and that has happened you now recently in uh, Karachi, where they built this massive nuclear plant right basically next to the city. I mean, you're putting an entire city at risk um, in a way that you don't have to do with the technology that's currently available to generate energy in other ways. So I, I, I think there's no real argument for nuclear except the fact that, one, it doesn't emit uh, greenhouse gases. That's basically the only thing I see in its favor. And even that you can do with other technologies. So, you know, why, why build things that will be obsolete? Like, it's like, like the CFL light bulb, right? It was more efficient than the incandescent light bulb. But then along came the LED. And now the CFL light bulb is just like a source of mercury. That's poison. Right? So if you could have gone directly from the incandescent to the LED, why wouldn't you do that? Why would you need that intermediate step uh, to get that? Uh, I'd also like to ask you about waste to energy conversions. I mean, I know this was a year in which we actually had people buried literally under mountains of garbage. I mean, I, I hear that there are places in, in Colombo where um, the municipality has actually told people we won't be collecting your organic waste soon. I mean, do you think that we're going to move towards the stuff that Sunila talked about, this kind of idea that we will all have to manage our own waste? Or do you also see these kind of huge plants coming up where we will basically continue not to take responsibility for it? I mean, kind of, I think my view of a future city is a little different from Sunila's, or completely different. I, I see giant so please megapolis elaborate on type that. Yeah. structures. You see big uh, structures. Right, because I, I don't think, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, that there is enough land for us to be able to do anything like this. Um, I think Sri Lanka has 21 million people in the country, 65,000 kilometers in area, right? So uh, I, I think I did this calculation once some time back, and it's about for each person in Sri Lanka, you have a square of about 180 feet square. So that's it right now. In the Western province, you have a square of about 80 feet. Right, so it's a very small square per person. So, and in that square, you have to generate your energy, you have to grow your food, and all that has to happen inside that square. So, I I don't think that living in this kind of pastoral way is a possibility for the future. For the future, maybe, I mean, if we could reduce the population of the country drastically <laughs> by some means, maybe it would be possible. But otherwise, I don't I don't see that that kind of future happening. So, when it comes to waste to energy. Waste to energy, I mean, obviously has been talked about a lot. The technology is there. Uh, it's just that there has been reluctance to implement it in Sri Lanka. Uh, various factors have been brought forward as to why. Uh, but since the last uh, collapse of the, the garbage mountain, I think people are actually being pushed into doing this. So I think in a couple of years, we'll see some waste to energy. I mean, the technology is very simple. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. Uh, you just need to sort your garbage better and have a technology to 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 convert that to energy. Uh, so I think we'll see that happen in a couple of years' time. Um, I'm just going to just ask one final question before we uh, watch a video and then we move to the Q&A. And I wanted to ask you all in your individual fields in, in 2017 or in the last few years, what has been a development that filled you with optimism? What was something that you are looking forward to kind of seeing develop that was an inspiring moment for you in your field? I'm sorry, I know I'm just throwing this out of the book. Would you uh, take a moment? <laughs> this does not bode well for <laughs> authors. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that in a very micro sense. You know, uh, this is, uh, 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 there was this gloom predicted about about the news media about uh, e even the largest most successful mass media organizations in the world were taking a dip but i think over the last few years we've seen a turnaround only for a few but i think we've seen a turnaround in media like like the new york times the washington post is now seen as very optimistic the journal has has been always doing doing fantastically well uh, behind paywalls uh, we don't see uh, an equivalent in Asia or, or even even in Europe, but but 
that boards or that that gives me some sense of optimism that that there is a section of people out there willing to pay for good content uh, and and that takes that uh, takes uh, the media away from uh, to some degree from the pressures of its agenda being controlled by by third party brands uh, essentially a, a, a note of optimism you know against the trend that made me very happy too i must say uh, uh, for me, I think that note of optimism would be Tesla. Right. Right. There's one guy basically who's building a company to shoot rockets into space at dramatically cheaper rates, to build giant battery packs that could power your house and solar roofs that could help you do that, and to build electric cars. Uh, so it's just a reminder that all of this stuff is possible right now. So that's what's happening. I think that one company is really helping to create that narrative. So I, I found that very inspiring. Um, so first, let me just respond to what you were saying, because um, I think I did say that there won't be enough space. So there would be vertical cities. And actually, what I do see as uh, something positive are the forest cities yeah. that uh, are being designed for China. Have you uh, seen one in have you ever had a chance no, to see one? I, I don't think there are any that are actually completed right. yet. So, but I do yeah. think I, when you when you showed me the highways, um, hmm. I do think there are those kind of initiatives do exist, right? I think in the U.S. especially. Uh, which one? The, the forested highways. I mean, where you actually have parks and things on. I uh, was actually talking right. of filling those tarmacs and growing trees on them, but I don't <laughs> think that's <laughs> happened yet. <laughs> Shri Ganesh. Well, the reason it was a tough thing for me to think about an answer was because I, I think in a way data is there for all of these sort of is yeah. its path through society, through the economy, through media, energy and you know energy has the same in, in, in all of these um, and I'm sort of trying to think what is a manifestation of what gives me hope and, and, and for me actually it's the things I'm able to do on my phone that I realized very in the last couple of years that you're able to do which is voice to speech. I'm able to talk to Google Assistant. It understands my weird accent <laughs> um, and gives me the answers that I want. Uh, that flicker of where we've transcended the ability where we used to do quite crap translations, uh, computer aided, and this, you know, uh, that, that is now being able to, to do, that gives me hope for better machine human interaction in the future because we need that to be able to manage the overload of information that is that is continuously on us thank you so much